Thank you very much. I was very happy to have that moment of meditation. It was a great help before coming on. Uh, what inspires me are uh, children who live in war zones around the world. We don't always hear so much from them, so it's my honor to uh, try to be able to be a little bit of their mouthpiece today. If we take a look at the 25 to 30 armed conflicts that occur at any point in time around the world, what we find is that children comprise about half the population and they are faced with unspeakable risks. So some of the sources of vulnerability, which I'm sure you're familiar with, are death of parents, family separation, sexual violence, uh, rape, recruitment into armed uh, groups, exposure to HIV and AIDS, uh, living in ongoing abject poverty, gender discrimination. The list goes on and on. Well, faced with so many risks, the children need our support. But there's a pernicious myth that has arisen. And that myth is that somehow they are a lost generation, as if they were damaged goods. Well, I want to say that having worked uh, with children in war zones in Latin America, Asia, Africa for the past couple of decades, and having been inspired by the resilience of these young people, I'm here to say that that is a myth that must be undone. But to say that young people is resilient is not to say that they don't need support. When I first started working in war zones and I saw people with no clothing, scrambling for food, uh, wondering how they were gonna get housing and health care, I honestly thought that education would somehow be a remote, distant concern. But young people shattered that myth. They told me that what they wanted more than anything in the world was to be educated. They saw it as their hope. They saw it as their future. They saw it as the fulfillment of their dream. And they wanted it even in the midst of an emergency or in a post-conflict zone. So with that in mind, I'd like to tell uh, the story of a couple of young people who asked me to tell their stories uh, so that they would get uh, more help for children affected by armed conflict. First, I'd like to uh, take you to northern Afghanistan. Uh, the year is 2003. Uh, there's a lot of triumphalism as the U.S. forces had just combined with the uh, Northern Alliance to uh, seemingly roll back and defeat uh, the Taliban. And it was there in the province of uh, Kunduz uh, that I met a uh, nine-year-old girl named Abiba. Abiba had lived in a camp for internally displaced people uh, for approximately three years. She and her family had lived through the Soviet occupation, the Mujahideen era, uh, the war with the Taliban. And uh, their homes had been destroyed, but they were excited because they were able to return uh, to their village. The problem was when they came home, everything was destroyed. They were literally building from scratch. And in that village, there was no school and there had never been a school. Abiba said that she had always wanted to go to school like her brothers. But given the harsh gender norms in Afghanistan, the rules were that she would have to walk outside of her village and she couldn't do that on her own. Uh, the gender norms actually required that she would be accompanied by a brother uh, or a family member. So her dream for education had never been fulfilled. Well, in that situation of uh, no school, and of all the buildings been shattered, it would have been very problematic to try to uh, approach education in the modality of opening schools. There were no functioning schools. So what uh, a number of NGOs did was we began working on non-formal education. Education that doesn't look like formal school. Education that can be started under a tree. Education that involves members of the communities and not just teachers. And above all, education that is holistic and doesn't just look like an intellectual curriculum, but that has emotional, social, and spiritual elements uh, woven into it. So in that context, uh, the NGO that I was uh, working with at that time worked with community members to identify the people who help children and who children seek uh, for assistance. They identified uh, a teacher and a religious leader. And these were the people identified yet by young people themselves. And out of that, young, uh, the, uh, uh, those people working with community members and with uh, older youth began organizing for several hours each day a whole set of activities, 
under a tree without any structure. They began teaching reading. Abiba went and was thrilled with the opportunity uh, uh, to learn. She sang songs. She even engaged uh, in some uh, plays. She socialized with other children. And she learned about some of the immense protection risks, one of which was that large numbers of landmines and unexploded ordnance remained in that environment. And she learned how to recognize uh, and avoid those. This, by her own reckoning, was a turning point in her life. She said, I want to be a teacher more than anything in life. And I'm going to pursue education as a means of doing that. One small example from Abiba. But the problem is, not every child has access to education, even if access is present physically, even if there's a school and a structure and they can physically get there. Children are often affected by emotional, social, and spiritual wounds of war that make it very difficult for them to enter or to learn. So let me now move you to Africa, West Africa, to Sierra Leone, a tiny country that suffered a truly brutal war of a decade uh, that was quite infamous uh, for the amputations and other atrocities that were committed uh, against children and in some cases by children who had been abducted and trained by the so-called Revolutionary United Front, the main opposition group. There in the northern uh, province, after the conflict had ended, I met a young woman named Fatmata. She had been uh, forcibly abducted by the RUF from her village at age 12. And her captor took her as his, quote, bushwife. Uh, she became, in essence, his sex slave, and denial of sex was answerable by extreme punishment and uh, even by killing. Fatmata became HIV positive. She became a mother, and her baby became HIV positive. She lived a very difficult life, moving from uh, battle scene to battle scene, wondering how she was going to survive. When the peace process began, she went back to her community. She was badly stigmatized. By her own assessment and the assessment of her peers, her family, and community members, she was viewed as unacceptable. They said, you cannot eat off the same plate as others. And part of the reason for that was that her mind was not steady. In the local idiom, that meant that because she had been raped and sexually violated in the bush, she was believed to carry bad spirits. This was not just an individual affliction. These spirits were believed to be all-powerful, and if brought back into the family and the community, they could kill other people, cause uh, illness, crop failure, and a whole host of maladies. So asked what she needed, she said, I want education more than anything in the world, but I can't go to school because my mind isn't steady. And so we asked, what would steady your mind? And she said, well, where I grew up, there had been healers, traditional healers, who could perform a cleansing ritual that would cleanse me of the bad spirits. And so we organized uh, a set of meetings with traditional healers, women who were highly respected in the community, who took some girls who had been uh, formally recruited, including Fatmata, and they gave them a purifying diet for about a month, gave them a lot of moral tutelage. And the girls needed this because in the RUF they'd been plied with drugs, taught to fight, they had a lot of conflictual aggressive behavior. And then they announced that they would uh, conduct a mass cleansing ritual for the girls. And on the day they assembled the village, uh, they had the girls sit down in a space that was demarcated by herbs, uh, the burning of which was uh, believed to produce fumes that had properties that would keep bad spirits out. And they fumigated the girls. The girls put a blanket over their head and uh, uh, breathed some vapors that were believed to expunge the bad spirits. They were stripped down and ritually washed with a black ash soap that was believed to uh, draw spiritual impurities out. And at the end, they were dressed in white with a red sash that was typical of the region. And they were presented to the community with the words that these girls are now part of our community. They can live with us. 
They can interact with us. Now, this didn't solve all of Fatmata's problems, but it did a very big thing. She said, now my mind is steady. Now I can earn money and do business, and I hope that I can go to school. Subsequently, Fatmata was able to earn money uh, through some microcredit uh, uh, activities, and she earned enough money to be able to not only send herself to school, but to send her daughter to school. And so she fulfilled her dream and found uh, uh, life after the war to be something that was much more positive than it had been. Now this occurred because there was psychosocial support, not just education. And it didn't look anything like Western psychology, counseling, or uh, psychosocial support as we might understand it uh, here in New York. Now, psychosocial support is also important in educational settings and schools themselves. And a lot of this is provided by teachers. So teachers, if they interact with children in a caring, respectful manner, thereby aid children's recovery. If teachers reach out to children who are a little bit isolated and encourage them, if they provide stimulation and interaction, these things encourage healthy uh, emotional and social development. The trouble is, in war zones, teachers themselves have been strongly affected, and they themselves might be in need of some psychosocial support, even though, again, it might not look like Western-style counseling. So now I'd like to invite you to a third setting, Gaza, 2009. After the uh, very powerful Israeli military operations uh, months before, which destroyed large numbers of schools, displaced large numbers of people, and left many teachers feeling overwhelmed. It was there that I met Fedwa, who was a very dedicated teacher, really quite experienced, a woman of about 40 years of age. And she said, you know, before the attacks, I always felt like a competent teacher. I knew my students. I knew how to reach them. I knew how to care for them. But now, I hardly recognize myself. My mind, I can't control it. I have all these images. I have all these bad dreams. And my students are different. They act out. They do all these things, and I don't know what to do with them. Fadwa herself uh, had previously lived in a house with uh, nine people, her immediate family. Now, she, after the war, she had some 38 people, extended family members whose homes had been destroyed, who lived in her house. And they had to work multiple jobs in order to bring home enough food to feed everyone. And in that situation uh, of no electricity and extreme hardship, she said, I just can't steady my mind. So what she needed, and many other teachers need, is support in order that they can give children the care and attention that they need in education. I'm sorry to say that this is one of the larger unfulfilled needs in war zones around the world. And so it's something that we need to give our concerted attention to. Now, I've tried to emphasize the importance of education. And I've said repeatedly that uh, education is what children want most. So it makes it sound like being in school or getting into non-formal education is a wonderful thing, potentially. But we have to add a critical lens to our work in war zones. Throughout sub-Saharan Africa, one of the things that's said most frequently to me by young women is that uh, they dropped out of school or they're worried about being in school because their teacher abuses them. The male teacher takes as is right the expectation that a female student has to provide sex for grades. This kind of rampant exploitation has to end. Educational environments are promoting of uh, children's welfare only if they are protective. So psychosocial support is part of it, but child protection is another key part of it. In many countries, uh, the primary means of discipline in the classroom and out is to use a large stick. I'm not talking about a small stick. <laughs> I'm talking about a big stick. The first time I saw a teacher wield such a stick in Afghanistan, it was fully five feet in length, 
and about an inch and a half in diameter. And it was then that I realized that when they talked about punishment, they meant something fundamentally different uh, than what you and I would understand. This was normative. So my uh, strong admonition is to make education available, but to make it uh, uh, protective. So this is really profoundly important. So now let me conclude by just trying to pull together some of uh, the things that uh, the children have told us and that teachers have told us uh, from war zones. First of all, make education a priority, even in the midst of an armed conflict, even in the earliest days after the uh, ceasefire has been agreed. We don't have to wait for schools. Some of the best learning occurs through non-formal groups, groups of concerned parents who get together or as they're called, child-friendly spaces, the kind of non-formal learning that I mentioned uh, before in regard to uh, uh, Abiba. But it has to be made available for everyone. We have to use a gender lens. We have to make sure that it's available not only to the richest and wealthiest, but to the poorest and the most marginalized. What about the children with different forms of disabilities? What about the people who are badly stigmatized and held on the margins of society? Are we reaching out to them? And it's not enough to have curriculum and academics. We have to have a holistic approach that remembers that children's emotional, social, spiritual well-being is integral in order for them to be able to learn and to maintain their resilience. And we have to remember that protection uh, is crucial. Only if we do education in this manner Will we be in a position to fulfill our obligation to children to make them resilient, enable their resilience, to break cycles of war, to help socialize them for lives of peace with social justice? And if we do those things, then we fulfill our obligations to children who I think are the most precious resource in any society. Thanks very much.